this uh, 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 seminar titled Arts Therapies and an Activism for Death Education in the Palliative Psychology. This seminar uh, uh, allows to the activities of uh, the uh, Erasmus Plus uh, European project uh, Death Education for Palliative Psychology which involves uh, five uh, countries, Italy, Israel, Austria, Romania, and uh, Poland. Uh, let me thank uh, Shoshi Kaiser and uh, Silvia Piol for their activities. Thank you so much. Uh, you realized uh, and planned uh, everything for this seminar. Thank you so much. And uh, let me thank also all the speakers the really uh, um, clever uh, and uh, uh, motivated the speakers, uh, my Brit Arbien, uh, Chiara Franco, Marco Antonellini, Sara Pompele, Alice Culcasi, Erika Iacona, Lorenzo Palazzo, Silvia Piol, Aviv Kushmir, and uh, Professor Odor Kibi. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Odor Kibi. You are our light. And Giancarlo Biancalani, uh, Nurit Gafni. I hope you have an excellent time uh, and uh, we can discuss uh, these uh, uh, constructs, in particular, and activism, which is uh, a really new concept in health uh, studies, health uh, research. So I think we can link uh, arts therapies and uh, in activism, uh, not only for uh, uh, our future projects, but, but in, in particular uh, uh, to uh, develop uh, the area of arts therapies. In Professor Testoni, you are muted. You uh, uh, did you uh, listen to me or I oh, wait, just just for the last 30 okay. seconds. Okay, I don't know what happened, but uh, I hope you have an excellent time with us and uh, we can discuss together of this uh, significant uh, construct. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much and welcome everyone. Um, we um, we actually uh, we will listen to the all seven short presentation, and you are all free. Uh, feel free to write and raise questions for responses in the chat. Uh, we will collect your questions, and at the end of the seven presentation, we will answer the questions according to uh, the time left. And now I'm. Glad to invite uh, Dr. Gianmarco Bincalini. Um, he's a psychologist, a psychodramatist in training, a research fellow at the University of Padua. Gianmarco, please, uh, will talk about the importance of diffusion of death education and pediatric psychology in Europe DE4PP project, please. Thanks a lot. Um, I would like to share the screen uh, to show the presentation so uh, can you see it uh, in a right way okay this is good we can see it um okay maybe no okay now it's oh it goes okay so um Thank you everybody to be there with us. Uh, the title of this presentation is The Importance of the Diffusion of Death Education and Palliative Psychology in Europe. So I would like to start talking about uh, what death education is. Uh, the term death education refers to a multitude of educational activities and experiences that deal with the theme of death and dying. There are three levels of prevention. The primary level that uh, happens before having to face death, for example, when we speak about death and dying uh, in a school context with students. The secondary level uh, of prevention uh, is happening in front of dying um, um, to manage the anticipatory grief. And uh, 
Finally, the tertiary level uh, that happens when someone dies uh, and uh, um, help to um, help to manage the. Oh, I'm sorry, but I have to admit to all people uh, and help to and help to manage uh, with the prolonged grief uh, prevention. Okay. The fundamental objectives of death education are the development of an adult idea of death, the development of a positive coping strategies with respect to mortality salience events, the development of emotional awareness and resilience and compassion and empathy. The stakeholders of death education projects are ordinary people during whole life cycles and passions. Health professionals, such as psychologists, physicians, nurses, uh, and so on, especially the ones uh, who have to work uh, with the uh, terminally people, uh, and uh, educators and teachers who can help students uh, uh, to understand, better understand uh, what death and dying mean. Oh. Okay, um, death education uh, has its roots uh, on terror management theory. So the management of what? Of the fear of death. Um, so when someone um, uh, enters in contact with a mortality salience event, uh, uh, event uh, uh, something happens uh, inside himself or herself. Um, we have uh, anxiety buffers against uh, the fear of death, uh, uh, such as the denial of death, uh, the self-esteem, uh, and the cultural worldviews. Uh, let's see them. So the anxiety buffer protection against the over-mortality reminders is provided thanks to defense, to, to defensive mechanisms. The first one uh, is the proximal defenses. Um, so treat focus the forts uh, to deny or avoid the problem of death. And uh, these uh, defenses uh, that are efforts uh, to continue to believe in a cultural worldview and gain self-esteem. Um, as regards uh, palliative psychology, the psychological support in palliative care is not only assigned to psychologists. Um, it is expected that all professionals working in palliative care acquire basic knowledge of the psychological dynamics at work in life-limiting disease, uh, as well as related skills in communication and psychological risk assessment. In fact, psychologists can improve not only patients and family well-being, but uh, that of their healthcare team and medical system. In doing so, psychologists contribute to the transformation of the delivery of the health care such that uh, all patients uh, with serious illness have accessible high-quality care. The fundamental key points uh, are, uh, uh, first of all, the, the psychologist's role in palliative care that is not well delineated. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the aims of the newly created European Association for Palliative Care Task Force on Education for Psychologists in Palliative Care is to clearly define this role. Uh, in addition, there are not postdoctoral curricula in palliative and hospice care for psychologists. Finally, uh, the developing of an international core curriculum for the psychologist in palliative care that can help uh, to identify the competencies that are suitable across different countries. So let's talk about uh, the Death Education for Palliative Psychology project. Um, as Professor Testoni said, uh, um, there are five countries uh, uh, in this project. Uh, first of all, the Italy, with the University of Padua, that is the head of the project uh, that is coordinated by Professor Testoni, and uh, Antitalia Onlus Foundation, that is a non-profit organization uh, who, sorry, um, who helps uh, um, cancer patients. 
Then we have uh, the Lucian Blaga University of Sibiu in Romania. We have Poland with the John Paul II Catholic University of Lublin. We have uh, Israel with the University of Haifa and uh, Austria with the University of Klagenfurt. The objectives of the project are, first of all, training students from European University who may in the future take part in a multidisciplinary team of palliative care and pain management. They're proposing psychological strategies to manage these issues in order to keep anxiety under control. In fact, uh, the contact with mortality can be an important opportunity for personal maturation and growth. The educational objectives of the, pro of the project uh, are the knowledge of the fundamentals of palliative care and bereavement, the knowledge of the basic elements of palliative psychology and psychological bereavement support, and the knowledge of the different artistic techniques compatible with psychological support. The participants are 100 students, about 100 university students, 20 per each country, who in the future could take part in a palliative care and pain management groups. They will follow the e-learning course about the themes of the project. Then 20 students, five per each country, among those who have followed the e-learning course, will be selected to participate in international learning, teaching and training activities. The 20 students will be selected based on the best photo voice project and on the best theoretical knowledge that will be examined with a final test. So, the phases of the project are uh, at least uh, 20 students per each country will complete a questionnaire and five of them will be also interviewed to understand their interest about death education and palliative care. With these elements, so on the basis of these results, uh, we will be able to create uh, the didactic material for the e-learning course. Then we will have a pre-test assessment, so the a time zero psychological assessment of the 20 students that will be selected uh, in each country and they will take part in the e-learning course uh, and uh, in a group phototherapy activity divided into uh, five people per group. Um, then we have the post-test assessment that is divided into the psychological assessment, the learning evaluation, and a short questionnaire about the liking of the online course. Uh, at the end, we have the Erasmus Plus phase. So the, five, the best five people uh, per country who have obtained the, the best result in the final exam on the content of the online course who have done the best photo voice work will go to Bologna to visit the ANT headquarters. So during this visit, they will be able to visit Terminal Hill patient together with the health staff who are responsible for providing them with medical and psychological support and they will have a psychodrama experience. So the expected impact of this project uh, is first of all to integrate uh, a new higher cu educational curricula, then to implement network of collaboration between uh, the universities, uh, the exchanging uh, of good practices by learning new methods, uh, the enhancing uh, of the psychological constructs uh, thanks to the experiential techniques, uh, and the increasing of knowledge and awareness on palliative care and death education. We would like to share with us the preliminary results uh, of the exploratory study of the first phase uh, uh, that uh, we are going to publish uh, um, in, maybe in this month. Uh, the purpose of this exploratory study, study was to assess how master's degree students in psychology and the arts therapies self-rate their interest and confidence in death education, palliative and bereavement care. So the participants uh, uh, was uh, 334 master degree stu students. Uh, students. Uh, the students uh, were also, as I said, invited to indicate uh, uh, 
uh, if they agree to participate in a short interview on the topic. So the results uh, of the data collection, um, so what they were, collect, they were collected uh, by uh, the online questionnaire, who especially included five uh, aspects uh, that are, were very important. So the general topics of the project, uh, obtaining practical and clinical competence for working with clients who are coping with the hand of life condition and or bereavement, acquiring theoretical knowledge about end of life condition and or bereavement, uh, actually working with these clients and learning about art therapies and or psychodrama intervention for these clients. Uh, all this information uh, was uh, fundamental because uh, uh, we, we we are able now to construct uh, the e-learning course. So the training curriculum uh, should consider it according to these results. The knowledge about the history and current situation for that education and palliative care. Students' self-awareness and reflective processes, development of, of care, planning skills and collaborative practice, cross-cultural perspectives on death, spiritual influences on the experience of death and terminal illness, knowledge of the bereavement patterns of anticipatory and complicated bereavement, communication skillfully and sensibly with patients, their families, and the interprofessional team within and outside the healthcare system. So the experiential training can include the psychodrama approaches and artistic therapies that are fundamental to better cope uh, with the death anxiety. So I thank you everybody um, to be there and I thank you Soshi for this presentation. Thank you very much Gianmarco. You're all, of course, welcome to write your questions and responses in the chat. And Sylvia, please. Uh, hi, uh, I would like uh, to present now Maybrit Arbian. Uh, Maybrit uh, is a clinical psychologist. She's also a psychotherapist in training and a, a research fellow at the University of Padua. And uh, she will present uh, a work from the title Embodied and Activism recent approaches to cognition and possible integrations uh, into theory and interventions in grief. And now, um, yeah, uh, Maybrit, you, you can start whenever you want sharing the screen. Good evening to everyone. I have to share the screen. Um, can, you, can you all see my presentation? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, when it comes to grief and bereavement, um, one can easily, oh, that's not working. Can you see that I skipped the slides? Yes, yes I can, yeah. Okay, perfect. <laughs> All right, sorry, technical issues. So uh, my task today is to give a short introduction to uh, what is called embodied inactivism and uh, try to integrate these, this approach uh, to theory and interventions of grief. So when it comes to bereavement and grief, it's easy to say, oh my gosh, where's my mind? Actually, there's uh, research and um, philosophical currents who took this question quite literally. So where's my mind? Is cognition in the head or in the word? Or is this or is it some mix of brainy and worldly processes? Latest research on embodied cognition and 4E cognition has motivated numerous researchers and debates about questions such as this, the location of cognition. There's actually a strong research tradition both in philosoph philosophy of mind and cognitive science that takes cognition to be a fully in the head event. In my presentation, I want to give a brief overview on a radically different approach proposed by embodied inactivism. As part of the 4E cognition movement and as a philosophical orientation, embodied inactivism promotes a conceptualization of cognition, not in terms of cognition in the head, but as cognition in the world, involving environmental and bodily factors. 
This view clearly poses a challenge to the standard science of cognition, especially to cognitive neuroscience with a claim to provide full and extensive explanations in terms of one factor, neuroprocessing or mental representation. Embodied inactivism promotes a conceptualization of cognition that is not reducible to passive brain processes or to any, any single factor, but involves a rich variety of factors regarding the body, the environment, and understands the mind as an active, embedded, me meaning-making process. So um, to give you an overview about the epistemi epistemological roots and um, main authors, I gave you just this short list to um, make you understand how heterogeneous uh, this approach is. So we have the earliest an activist, which is clearly a Wittgenstein with the primacy of action and the body, and then later um, brought ahead by uh, Varela, Thompson and Roche, which are influenced by phenomenology and Buddhism, by Oregon and Noe, uh, influenced by cognitive science, Hu Tsui Min, an analytic philosophy of mind, and finally Gallinger, phenomenology. So these different approaches are necessarily heterogeneous and can be lo located on different points on the continuum between weak and radical inactivism. Nonetheless, there are some basic assumptions that serve as common ground of these different perspectives. Without going into details about the differences, I'd like rather to focus on the three shared elements and sh three shared concepts of embodied inactivism, which are also called 4E cognition movement. These are embodiment, embeddedness, and inactivism. Embodied inactivism sees the brain and body as connected in a non-Cartesian way. So the mind is constituted both by brain and by body. Thus, the mind is fully material, constituted by the brain-body system. We are embodied beings. The mind is not a thing above or beyond the organism, neither in a Cartesian sense, where mind and body are made of different kind of stuff, nor in an information theory sense. Our mind is, a differ is different than a software as it cannot be uploaded to any computer. The body is understood as what phenomenologists called the lived body, which includes more than just motor control and conscious representation of the body, but involves the full ensemble of bodily factors that may or may not be accessible to conscious awareness. The second basic concept is embeddedness. The mind is richly influenced by the physical, social, and cultural environment across its development. Interaction with the environment within which the organism is situated provides the necessary condition for cognition. To explain human behavior, one must take into account the brain-body environment. Uh, brain-body environment create a system which in reference to system theory uh, has relationships that are necessarily richly circular. The system is more than the sum of the single elements as taught by Gestalt therapy um, and as one system of the element, element of the system changes, the whole system uh, constituted by brain, body and environment necessarily has to change. Finally, inactivism. We are inactive beings, uh, means we are intrinsically purpose, purposive with a strive to self-maintain and adapt to changing circumstances. The mind works in an action-oriented fashion and develops meaning based on interactions and relationships with the world. Meaning is based on, on the need for relation with the environment. So, Within embodied and activism literature, cognition and perception are seen as reasonably continuous and are often referred to as sense-making, as an umbrella term. This highlights their relational nature. A classical example, for, um, for instance, is the, is the experience of color. In a traditional cognitive thought, redness, so the, um, in a, a red, the red color of an object, is inside the mind of the person um, as the neural cord in our brain in response to a stimuli uh, of our optic nerve. Embodied inactivism instead provides a different answer. 
redness is relational, as said Fox. It exists between the agent and the world is, and is gen generated by the organism to help it make sense uh, about the, the environment and the world accordance to its needs. Color exists for the organism, not inside of it. And its learned model of experiencing the world directly and in an active and conscious process where the environment is a world of imminent meaning and balance. Moreover, the system of brain, body, environment is primordially effective, effective in the sense of emotional. The mind is not a linear symbol, uh, symbol processing machine, it's not um, defined by inputs and outputs, it's not um, a cool, detached endeavor. The organism is affected by its environment. What we encounter matters to us, and we are affected by what is surrounding us. Directly to re related to this evaluative, value-sensitive character of sense-making is its affective character. Sense-making often requires no conscious processing. Sense-making is first and foremost a direct body, bodily affective evaluation without conscious processing. Thus emotions are not separate to cognition but are both part of meaning. Affective factors involve a complex motivational dimension that animates our body-world relationship. Taken together, embodied and activism with its main assumption that cognition emerged from processes distributed equally across the brain-body environment system uh, emphasizes the extended intersubject intersubjective embodied and socially situated, situated nature of cognition, as well as meaning making, and thus may serve as a powerful theoretical tool to enrich research models and intervention in grief. Unfortunately, since today, few, there have been few integrations of embodied inactivism and grief, um, and uh, this is in a hard contrast to uh, the experience of anyone who lost a person which he held dear, who lost a future project, who lost a uh, uh, part of one's identity, as in first person we experience the deeply holistic manner in which loss affects our lives, emotions, bodies, relationships, thoughts, and meaning, make, meaning making. Nonetheless, even the adopted terminology in bereavement research alludes to a conceptual distinction of the in individual and the environment. The distinction of terms grief and mourning highlights the conceptualization of uh, the differentiation between the individual aspect of reacting to loss in the social dimension. So individual and environment and social environment seem somehow to be separated. In fact, most models of grief, for instance, uh, the stage models of Kubler ross and Bowlby as the task and process models adopt a rather individual and cognitive perspective on how the bereaved reacts to and copes with loss. Um, even though many grief models adopt an action-oriented perspective in the process of accommodation to loss, the aspects of embodiment and embeddedness, um, so the interpersonal, social, cultural environment seems to be taken into account and uh, with secondary importance. Embodied and activism contrasts the distinction of brain, body, and environments and promotes a more integrative view on the phenomenon of loss. So where can we find uh, uh, aspects of inactivism in recent uh, works on grief? We can look at the meaning reconstruction model um, proposed by Nai Maya, which puts emphasis on the necessity to regain sense in one's assumptive world which has been disrupted by loss. The bereaved becomes the active uh, architect of new representations of the world, of new representations of the relationship to uh, the bereaved, and so on. Nonetheless, as it bases on cognitive, uh, on constructionist approach, um, meaning reconstru reconstruction model puts a lot of emphasis on cognitive elaboration and mental representation thus lacks a more embodied approach. In uh, grief models and research, we can find a more embodied approach in uh, continuing bonds. 
So bereavement research thus far has emphasized the physical body um, more in terms of mortality salience. So um, being more aware about one's own mortality and the impact, impact of grief on physical symptoms how grief and loss are experienced through physical health and body pain. Yet, our bodies matter also in relationships. In that sense, some attention has been given to the use of the body in continuing bonds theory. Through sensory strategies regarding voice, touch and smell, um, the bond with the deceased is maintained. Research suggests that bereaved individuals often feel the presence of the deceased hearing her voice, seeing her face, all of which are expressions of the continuing bond phenomenon. Likewise, uh, early study by Rees, which I cited you here, found that almost half of, the, half of the bereaved experienced the presence of the deceased physically in one or more sensory, sensory modalities up to 10 years following the death. So to conclude um, the more embodied aspect on grief, I brought to you a really interesting study of Leichentritt et al. Uh, from 2014, who conducted qualitative analysis of 30 interviews and um, um, created categories of the embodied uh, experience of loss. So we have, um, on one hand, the presence of the deceased in the bereaved's body, especially when it's a family member, uh, bereaved report um, tell us the, the kind of feel that the deceased continues living within them, maybe across the DNA, or maybe by, may, by, by uh, making a tattoo, or maybe by adopting gestures or allergies even. Secondly, um, bereaved tend to uh, employ body associated actions and activities. So um, the bereaved uses body related activities as a means for controlling the connection to the uh, deceased, as through disciplining the body by privation to sexuality, for example, or the induction of pain as connection strategy to the deceased. Finally, also the body of the deceased matters. Connecting to the body image, the voice, preparing the table for the deceased, caregiving uh, for the deceased by caring for the grave or the objects of the person, is an important factor uh, in caring for the relationship with the deceased. Finally, embodied and activism teaches us to broaden the view on possible needs and struggles of those left behind by loss, on the importance of the body, the physical but also social cultural environment and its circular relationship with the bereaved that engage actively in the elaboration of grief. Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you very much, Margaret. And um, the second uh, presentation, um, we have five presenters. And um, I welcome now uh, Alice Kulkasi. Alice Kulkasi is graduated in clinical dynamic psychology at the University of Padova in 2020, and is currently a postgraduate trainee fellow at the FIS PPA department. Chiara Franco graduated in Applied Cognitive Psychology at the University of Padova in 2019. And in 2020, she graduated at the first level master in their studies and end of life program. Erika Ikuna is a clinical psychologist, psychotherapist in training and a research fellow at the University of Padova. Lorenza Palazzo, Luen is a clinical psychologist, psychotherapist in training and research fellow at the University of Padua. And Silvia Piol is a graduate in clinical psychology and in currently a postgraduate trainee fellow at the FIS PPA department. Um, they're going to present an activism applied psychology, medicine and palliative care. Please, thank you. So, Good afternoon. I'm very pleased to participate uh, to this uh, uh, seminar. 
And uh, now we will talk uh, uh, first about uh, some general concept uh, uh, of enactivism, an and then uh, we will focus on uh, some uh, literature concerning enactivism applied to some uh, uh, research areas. So, Silvia, going on, please. Uh, okay. As we have uh, seen before, an activism has built it itself mostly in opposition to internalist and computational models of the mind that uh, attempt to, to diminish uh, ex uh, experience uh, to mental mechanism or mental representation of uh, uh, the external world. On the other hand, the inactive theorists offer a new theoretical assumption for understanding what cognition is and how it works, breaking the tight conceptual connection between cognition and representation. In particular, the inactive approach assumes that uh, there is no clear cut ontological split between the individual and its environment. For this reason and perspective, the mind cannot be reduced to simply neural processes and uh, um, depict in uh, monist terms, uh, but uh, in, um, in uh, embodied ones. So the embodied mind emerges through active engagement with uh, the environment. Going on with the slide, okay. Overall, from traditional cognitivism, cognition is described as the activity of information processing mechanism. Instead, for an activist, the unit of analysis for understanding cognition is not the neuron, the, the brain, or other bodily tissues. It is instead the holistic dynamic interaction between a living being and its environment. In the uh, embodied mind, that is the uh, pivotal text of an activism, it is introduced the idea that cognition is not the representation of a determinate world by a determinate mind, but it is uh, the enact enactment of a world and a, a mind on the basis of, ac of actions uh, uh, that an organism performs in the environment. Going on, from this point of view, uh, cognition should be considered as the sense-making activity of, of an organism in, in interaction with uh, its environment, that is, uh, sense-making occurs when a, a person finds a significance uh, uh, in its world. Moreover, the sense-making is the fundamental uh, um, part of being alive. In fact, in order to stay alive, an organism must make sense of, of um, its environment, even in the very basic uh, sense of uh, uh, distinguishing, uh, for example, food from no food, danger from safety, and mates from no mates, and so on. According to an active perspective, it is therefore cl uh, clear that human psychological functioning and sense of meaning are shaped by bodily experience. And so it is not possible for mind uh, to function independent, independently of the uh, body because uh, they are essentially interrelated. Going on. So over the last few decades, an activism has gained relevance. And in light of this, now we will explore three possible areas of application of, of an activism, especially concerning the possibility of uh, uh, relocating psychopathology within the activist perspective, or in medical uh, domain concerning medical humanities, and in particular, narrative medicine and uh, the experience uh, of pain uh, in patients. And lastly, we will consider some general concept of uh, an activism in palliative care. Well, now Silvia will explain better. Silvia? You're muted, Silvia. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> 
The first domain I would like to talk about is, uh, um, is a psychology. And uh, as Chiara has already mentioned, one of the main aspects uh, relative to the um, psychological domain concerns uh, the possibility of relocating psychopathology within the inactivist um, frame and paradigm. In this respect, uh, uh, various scholars uh, have uh, tried uh, in the last few decades, uh, have considered um, a new explanatory model concerning the uh, etiology and the development of psychiatric disorders that could somehow fit uh, in the uh, Gallagher's uh, 3E model that has been discussed about the considering cognition as being both enacted, embodied, uh, and uh, embedded. The 3E cognition model is proposed as an alternative to the um, so defined reductive and materialist uh, aspiration, aspirations uh, brought about by the research domain criteria, uh, which have been accused uh, of being too neurocentric. One of the key values of the employment of the 3E um, is that it comprehends psychopathology in a holistic way. That is one in which um, values such as both bi biological values and, and processes uh, uh, are considered as well as uh, interpersonal and personal levels uh, of explanation. Um, according to the inactivist uh, conceptualization of psychiatric disorders, uh, um, the latter are understood primarily as uh, disorders of sense making, that is, uh, a, disorder way, a disordered way of relating to ourselves, uh, to uh, the other people, and uh, to the world. Um, social cognition, for example, deals with how people make sense uh, of other people's behavior, and uh, um, by employing an inactivist uh, uh, perspective, um, and op a possibility is open to reconceptualize uh, uh, problems connected to social cognition uh, uh, that could be related to disorders such as schizophrenia or autism as something going beyond an uh, internalist and individualist view and as something uh, that sees the psychopathology as arising from the interaction and therefore involving both social and cultural factors in addition to individual ones. Um, so, as uh, cognition could be also understood as a construction of a meaningful world, of a way of continuously engaging in this world, uh, art therapies would seem to be able to address psychiatric symptoms uh, by first engaging one's emotions and bodily feelings uh, as a gate uh, through higher level cognition and one's way of making sense of the world. Um, let's now focus on uh, uh, the medical domain. So narrative medicine is one such approach to medicine that falls within, within the inactivist perspective, following a paradigm shift from what is called a, a medical reductionism to medical holism that is not reducing the patient to, to um, his or her symptoms and to the disease, but seeing them as whole pe people and in context and in relations. Narrative medicine uh, strives, therefore, to go beyond a reductionist approach to capture something of the patient's lived experience uh, and uh, enter in the narrative world of patients. Uh, in the medical domain, a great deal of importance has been placed on the experience of pain within an inactivist perspective. The biopsychosocial model seems to present some limitations in that it does not allow a, a holistic understanding of pain in that it uh, uh, dichotomizes pain in either two, that is the biological and psychosocial, or even three biological, psychological, and social domains. Therefore, some authors have tried to reconceptualize, uh, reconceptualize pain within an inactivist approach that considers the 5E model, that is Gallagher's 4E model, plus uh, the, 4E, uh, the um, emotive uh, um, conception, um, as to overcome these uh, limitations con um, concerned with the biopsychosocial model um, and have therefore created a possible ten uh, tentative definition of what pain could be. Um, Steelwell and colleagues uh, have then tried to see how the use of metaphors uh, could be employed in medicine in order to co-construct with patients a, a meaning of pain that could be um, more in line with uh, a more contemporary and inactive, uh, inactive understanding of pain, as they have seen that by employing uh, structural metaphors, um, then they would uh, convey a linear understanding of pain 
that would bring forth uh, uh, meanings connected to danger or to weaknesses or to slow healing and fragility, as we can show from, uh, uh, from, what, from the metaphor that has been uh, uh, represented in the picture. Um, it is therefore important that clinicians work with patients as to construct such metaphors uh, that fall within this contemporary and inactive understanding of pain. And in order to reinforce these metaphors, uh, they should be they should be turned into an active metaphors. That is, um, um, the language should be um, coupled with um, nonverbal communication such as touch, in order for um, to reinforce this understanding of pain and to facilitate uh, patients' empowerment and also to improve pain-related outcomes. Um, finally, in line with um, um, with uh, uh, the conception, uh, with this conception of pain, Frank noted that a person's narrative uh, of her experience of pain can be told both uh, uh, about the body but also through the body. And uh, embodiment uh, seems to be brilliantly captured by, um, by a quote, uh, by a sentence uh, that a patient of Cecily Saunders uh, uh, once told her, she was a patient affected by cancer, and she once told her, well, doctor, the pain began in my back, but now it seems that all of me is wrong. A sentence is emblematic of what came to be then uh, known as the Cecily Saunders concept of, uh, um, of total pain, that is one including uh, both physical symptoms, but also mental disorders, as well as social and emotional problems, um, which is a key notion in what is now referred to as palliative care. And now Chiara will conclude the presentation by presenting some studies concerning the experiences of uh, embodiment in palliative care. So concerning what we have been pointing out uh, regarding the mind, the body, environmental relationship, uh, in the field of palliative care, the experience of the embodiment is to be understood as the sense of being in a body and also how this body uh, occupies its uh, uh, social space. Researchers observed that for dying people in hospice, the body image was no longer important to them, but for them it was important being able to function in comfort with as little pain as possible. Then um, the ways in which the bodies were affected by disease process and by treatment determine how patients live their lives and uh, experiences. Moreover, researches show that the embodiment represents the personification and materialization of our personal qualities of personhood. So uh, the body and the embodiment experiences are fundamental to our sense of being. During medical treatment or of a um, terminal illness, uh, patients can experience uh, um, that both the body and the self uh, are reduced to a disease, uh, so feeling somehow disconnected and uh, as an incapable spectator to a body that uh, everyone treats uh, as a passive object. In the face of uh, the end of life, uh, the professional's ability to understand the body's language is the key point of the patient care. In fact, most gestures of uh, nurses uh, who work in palliative care services uh, are expressed uh, through touch and body contact. And uh, uh, this aspect is, uh, is um, even more relevant when there is uh, little or no possibility of curing them. So to conclude, uh, we uh, going on with the slide. Uh, it, it should be the right one. I, I have the okay. right one. Thank you. To conclude, we could say that an activist um, facilitates the re-elaboration of some aspects of both uh, the medical and psychological domain. Further investigation in such areas can contribute to, to uh, relieve experiences, of, for example, ex experiences of illness and pain, and uh, overall uh, to um, embrace a more holistic uh, uh, perspective towards uh, health care and patient care. Thank you. Okay, so now uh, the next presenter is uh, Shoshi Keizari, 
Uh, Shoshi is a registered drama therapist. Um, she's a researcher in the field of clinical gerontology and the creative arts therapies. And these days, uh, she's also doing her postdoc research uh, in uh, Padua University with Professor Justin. Uh, she is presenting a work titled Creative Art Therapies as an inactivist intervention in time of loss and grief. And Shashi, do you want to share the screen? Yes, I would just like uh, first thanks for these three uh, wonderful presentations. And um, now I will open the gate to, to the creative art therapies. Uh. Right. Okay. Yes. Okay. I paint flowers so they will not die. Frida Kahlo. This presentation will introduce the field of creative art therapies from an activist perspective that enables to manage and reshape experiences of loss and grief through creative action. The presentation will follow with examples from practice and research. It is important to mention that the participant gave their written consent to use their artistic expressions and materials. However, all details were changed to keep their privacy. Creative art therapies is an umbrella term for healthcare profession that use the creative and expressive process of art making to improve to improve and enhance the psychological, mental health, and social well being of individuals of all ages and health conditions. Visual art, drama, music, dance movement, and poetry and literature provide means of self exploration and expression within a therapeutic relationship. The creative expressive process puts the individual into action by using tangible art materials, colors, shapes, embodied movement and gestures, gestures, auditorium music, sounds and text, performed or written poetry and stories, one can express, explore and make sense of their inner experiences. The therapeutic process of art making cross the boundaries of external reality. Art exist in the transitional space that hold together the inner and outer world. It allows movement between reality and imagination, between the self and the others, and can move easily in time between past, present, and future. Through the use of various artistic elements, the creative process enables to bring into existence internal experiences, inner voices, emotion in a most tangible way. The inner world can be expressed in a rich, complex language, a language of symbol and images, shapes and color, which is beyond words. As demonstrated here in a self-portrait of a 16 years old teenager girl, this is a drawing from observation in a therapy, a self-portrait that was created in art therapy group with adolescents conducted by the art therapist Nurit Wolk. Uh, at the end of the group process, the girl observed again her self-portrait and explained. Since it is a self-portrait, I did not just decide how to draw it. I also decide what facial expression would be in it. Well, I know that while I'm looking at it, I am seeing myself from the inside. I'm aware of the fact that if I were to look in the mirror now, I would see something different. In this way, the action of drawing expressed the inner experience and at the same time induce it with meaning. The ability to bring into existence the inner experience is an active engagement through the drawing shape, the way the individual, through the drawing, the way it shapes the individual perceive themselves and the way it can interact with others. Just a second, okay. Um, these pictures were taken in drama therapy session with older adults in adult day center in Israel. Here, the participant created a childhood image for one of the participants. 
the embodied dramatic action brought to life a past memory and transform it into a vivid living experience. The tangible aspect of the dramatic play awakened the old story in the here and now of the group process and fuse it with new shared experience that reshape their inner experience. And hear what Loni, the teller, said when she saw in the video the participant created her memory childhood. When they recreated my story, I went back to the past and I felt like I was really there, watching what I went through. I could see it in reality. I could see it as a dream. I saw everything again, how I moved, how it was, how it is. It made me feel good when I saw it because finally I had other people there with me who knew my story. And I wasn't alone. I am not alone. I could feel myself. This is me, so I say, here, this is me, and it does me good. The process of art making engages client holistically as it involves sensory motor, emotional, cultural, aesthetic, and social aspect of the self. The artistic expression holds the personal experience that is brought up by the, the individual and is transformed by action into a collective one that engage others. It engages the therapist, the other group members, and the community. This process can significantly contribute to meaning reconstruction in life experiences connected to death and dying and to traumatic events. This is a collage created in our therapy group conducted by the art therapist uh, Dr. Adas Telul. Marie is a 93 old woman, years old woman, Holocaust survivor, who described here in the collage the traumatic moment of the loss of her two sisters who suddenly disappear beyond the electric fence of the concentration camp and the moment she realized she will never see them again. The process of creating the collage is an action that bring together pieces of images as simple of the pieces of our traumatic life stories, life story. Through the action of choosing the pieces and images of this scattered story, cutting them, locating them on the blank specs, fixing them with the glue, adding the words and text, she could shape and embody the artistic expression of the story and make sense of it. Such a process helps to gain sense of mastery and control over the presentation of a traumatic event in a Iran world. This action brings testimony to a life story, but also by gathering scattered pieces of images into one aesthetic creation, the old broken traumatic memories are fused with sense of integration and meaning and the traumatic event and the horror is also induced with the liveliness of the active creative process. Death is considered to be the most threatening experience to human life, especially when irreversible irrever loss caused with the disruption of the bonds with beloved person. Grief is a natural response to the loss and the brave person have to walk through their grief by painful process till one can separate with the lost person. As Freud argued, in the grief, is not, the grief is not a passive process, but the job of work that finally should result in a complete separation. The artistic embodied action enables to create a concrete presence of the loss and of someone who died while engaging with others. This enabled to process the most difficult emotion that relate to the grief, to reveal, to expand and transform it in a way that can reshape the inner experience. As we can see in the following example, uh, which occur in drama therapy group in a doll day center. Ronit is an 81 years old woman, joined the drama therapy group about 10 months after the sudden death of her husband. At first, Ronit was unwilling to leave the house and to meet people. She claimed that for six years, her beloved husband was her main company. She said, and she said she cannot find meaning in her life since he passed away. 
Encouraged by the social worker, she started coming to the adult day center and there she joined the drama therapy group. In one of the sessions, a year after he passed away, we, want, we handed over an old phone, a dial phone, and invited the group participant to have an imaginary dramatic phone call with whoever they would like. One can talk to his inner voice, to his anger or fear. They can talk to God. They can talk to their grandchildren who were not born yet. And they can, of course, talk to lost, meaningful people in their life. Ronnie chose to talk to her deceased husband and so the conversation between them resumed. Ronit, David, can you hear me? Where did you go so fast? I am waiting for you. Did you forget? Last year we went together and we did the shopping for the holiday. Just before the new eve, you said, take everything you need. We don't need to save money. I had such a good time with you. Suddenly it was holiday and you did not feel well. Your drink was ready for you. The children and grandchildren were supposed to come. You sat and felt like a king and waited for them. What happened? Suddenly you did not feel well. Instead of celebrating and doing the Kiddush, we took you to the hospital and we were with you all night. What happened? I miss you so much, David, and cannot forget I remember you every day and every moment in my life. If you're here, please pray for us, for the children, for the grandchildren, for the great-grandchildren you love so much. You love them all. You love the holiday. You love so much the land. I ask you to pray for us and for all the people in Israel that will be happy uh, New Year for us, without wars and without troubles. Amen, amen, the group said. And then Ronit added, David, I will see you soon, okay? But actually, actually no. Actually no, I want to live longer, to be with the grandchildren, to see them grow up, to be present in their pregnancies. For now I will say goodbye. Pray for us from above. Pray for the children and grandchildren and rest in heaven, David. Rest in heaven, David, and pray for us. The example demonstrates an embodied dramatic action of the grief work. The dramatic, dramatic reality, surplus reality, enabled one to recreate a symbolic encounter and to conduct a symbolic dialogue, an active dialogue with her beloved David, with an, and enabling her to say things she did not have the chance to say and to conduct a farewell. In this dialogue, she expressed both past experiences when she remembered the things they were doing together. She told the group and herself who David was, which person he was. She shared and processed with him the traumatic event of his sudden death, her, pre her present grief work, and she also created a future perspective for, the, for both of them. How can she see the future? And she chose to live to be able and to be able to separate. In the next part, two players, two actors were selected by the team to play Ronit and her husband David and to conduct a dramatic dialogue between them. Chaim, another participant in the group, play David, the husband. When the conductor asked Ronit what David would tell you now, she thought and said, he will remind me of the days before he knew, we knew each other. He will remind me that I was in the Jewish underground, that I saved the lives of many. He will remind me the way I fought, that I saved my family and that I brought everyone to Israel. He will remind me how strong I am and that I'm actually a very strong person. You can see here in the picture, the dramatic scene where the actor participant who played the husband bring a small box with a gift he gave her 60 years ago when they just met. And he told her, take care of yourself. Remember that you are the strong and underground girl. You will be able to overcome everything. And now it is important that you enjoy the grandchildren and great children and take care of the family and be strong. This part of the dramatic action represents a kind of role reversal. 
Roni chose to bring to life another piece of identity. She is a morning woman, but she is also independent fighter, stronger woman, and the way she could save others. She can also save herself in this harsh time to grief. To conclude, this dramatic action, through its tangible aspect of the artistic process, enable to open a connection and dialogue with a deceased person, and at the same time, it enables to reconstruct new experience, to make sense and in the new experience and to explore and develop new forms of living. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shoshi. Thank you for sharing your clinical experience. I think it was really, really. So now uh, our next presentation, our next presenters are again, Chiara Franco. Uh, who was already presented before, then Marco Antonellini, who is a graduate, who graduated in organizational psychology in uh, 2020. And at the moment, uh, he is uh, uh, serving as a trainee conducting research on the psychological effects of COVID-19 on health prof professionals. And uh, Sara Pompele, uh, Sara is a clinical psychologist. She's also a psychotherapist in training and research fellow at the University of Padua. They are presenting a work entitled Spirituality and the Essential Contribution of Arts Therapies. Thank you and good evening. So um, we will try to explore the relationship between art therapies and the concept of spirituality. I would like to start by taking a moment to explore the concept of spirituality, which is very complex and fascinating. And we could obviously discuss about it for hours, but I will try to convey as much as possible some core elements of this theme in a few minutes. So what is spirituality then? Um, it is very faceted and complex to delineate. However, merging together different researches and definitions which have been given over the years, we could define it as a way of being in the world in which a person feels a sense to connectedness to, um, to self, the others, and or a higher power or nature, a sense of meaning in life and transcendence beyond self, everyday life, and suffering. So three fundamental core elements are part of the concept of spirituality, connectedness, which could be defined as a sense of relatedness to oneself, others, nature, the world, or a higher power, God or supreme being. Meaning in life, which is the feeling to have a purpose in life and appreciating it immensely because of this. And transcendence, which is in the ability to see beyond the boundaries of self, the environment, one's present condition, and the ability to change one's outlook on a given situation and on life overall even. Another fundamental aspect of spirituality which needs to be considered is that contrary to what many might believe, it does not necessarily involve the belief in a divine entity which differentiates it from religion, which is indeed a specific way of expressing and living one's spirituality for a typical set of beliefs, of course, but does not coincide precisely with spirituality itself. So spirituality represents an innate human need, we could say, which can spontaneously emerge and be expressed by everyone in different ways. Maslow, for example, described the, and called the peak experiences, those moments, very rare and beautiful in life, in which spirituality emerges in a person's life in a very intense way, and he also inserted spirituality in his hierarchy of needs at the top of his pyramid as, um, as part of the self-transcendence needs, human needs. So um, spirituality, and this is very relevant because it means that spirituality can certainly be a fundamental necessity also for those people who do not uh, consider themselves religious. However, unfortunately, literature still tends 
you underestimate this aspect, there is very little literature on this very important aspect. So spirituality has been proved to be an essential element for people's psychological well-being. And this becomes even more essential during those peculiar moments in life, very painful and complex, in which a person feels the sense of personal identity or purpose in his or her life to become very, very uh, difficult to, you, to, to feel, to understand. For example, during mental illness or, of course, terminal illness and the end of life. And many researches and studies have highlighted the significantly positive effect of spirituality on people, for example, who suffer from depression or PTSD, or people, of course, who are facing a terminal illness, because it helps them feel more serene and empowered, it increases their coping abilities, and it allows them to better accept even the, the end of their life, and sometimes to even tolerate more the related physical pain that could come with this moment. So uh, through the many different ways in which spirituality could be um, expressed and reached by different peoples, the arts, and especially in a therapeutical context, could certainly represent a fundamental tool. So now my colleague, Marco Antonellini, will explore more in depth this relationship. Thank you, Sarah. Um, as Sarah said, the arts could certainly represent a fundamental tool through the many different ways in which spirituality can be expressed and enhanced, uh, especially in psychotherapy. Heart therapies represent a variety of therapeutic interventions that aim to improve a person's health and well-being to the, through the creative and expressive process of making art. Um, they are viewed as an integral component of holistic care for patients and families um, that through the creative process generate hope, uh, restore optimism, and help them cope with life's challenges. Introducing the arts in the care plan is a useful means of assisting patients both spiritually, emotionally, and physically. In addition to the intuitive uh, visual art, uh, which include uh, painting and uh, photography, for example, uh, there are also poetry or uh, bibliotherapy, which use uh, as an instrument of expression the literary compositions, uh, both in poetry and in prose. Um, psychodrama and drama therapy uh, are based on the exploration of uh, one's emotions through theatrical uh, dramatization, um, while dance therapy uses bodily expression often accompanied by music. Uh, and music is a fundamental element also in music therapy, but uh, we will deal with this uh, later. Okay. As Sarah uh, explained earlier, uh, the concepts of uh, spirituality and meaning making play a fundamental role in art therapies, uh, especially when uh, patients have uh, to face some particularly painful and uh, frightening moments in their life, uh, for example, like in uh, uh, terminal illness. This uh, happens because uh, art therapies can satisfy the need to express and explore uh, their own uh, spirituality. Um, feelings of uh, transcendence and uh, connectedness uh, are achieved through the creative act, uh, which make it possible to give meaning uh, to what is happening, uh, favoring its uh, understanding and uh, the consequent acceptance uh, so that the patient can achieve a sense of serenity and peace. As anticipated, <clears throat> now we will take a moment to discuss a little more in depth uh, music therapy. 
because um, its relationship with the spiritual dimension has been considerable uh, explored in literature. So music therapy could be defined as the use uh, of music in a therapeutic context. Uh, with the aim to improve uh, a person's physical and psychological well-being uh, and reduce his or her suffering. And music therapy uses techniques such as uh, evoking memory, for example, or uh, enhancing life review, or creating uh, audio recordings for families, and also writing songs of dedication. Uh, for example, like uh, biographical songs uh, or uh, songs for family member and also songs that uh, nurture the patient's sense of individual significance. Okay, now uh, I would like to share with you uh, a meaningful uh, citation to Aldridge, uh, which perfectly clarifies the concept of how spirituality can be reached through the art therapies and especially music therapy. If the progress of the disease is an increasing personal isolation, then the music therapeutic relationship is an important one for maintaining interpersonal contact, a contact that is morally non judgmental, where the ground of that contact is aesthetic. For the sick, maimed, disfigured, and stigmatized, the opportunity to partake in a greater beauty is important. Creativity can be used in the non-material sense, as in making music, as transcending the moment. In this transcendence, the essence of spirituality we take a leap, which is open to a new consciousness. That uh, this new consciousness is not bound up with our bodies, our instincts, our motor impulses, nor our emotions, awakens our awareness to another purpose within us. Art therapies can therefore perform some beneficial actions for the spirituality of the individual, uh, such as uh, facilitating a unique uh, experience of uh, transcendence uh, beyond the everyday, everyday routine and or suffering uh, by evoking a sense of wonder. Or uh, giving an experience uh, of time that is qualitatively richer rather than chronologically determined. And this gets uh, a kind of uh, calming effect. Or giving also the patient the opportunity to feel uh, renewed uh, learning a new way to deal with uh, the disease uh, due to the opening of new perspectives and uh, possibilities. In addition, uh, they may ensure uh, that the patient does not shut down, but maintains some uh, interpersonal uh, contacts instead. And last but not least, the creative uh, process uh, as a spiritual practice uh, as the potential to heal by allowing one to get in touch with the essence of the self and the beauty and the mystery of life, uh, giving a sense of uh, meaning to one's uh, existence. In conclusion, art therapy represents an extremely useful tool that can help patients get in touch and express their spirituality, uh, which is an essential dimension for every human being. Uh, also, literature is uh, still rather scarce concerning these themes. In the near future, uh, it, it would be fundamental to explore them more in depth uh, for the benefit of patient and uh, everyone in general. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this presentation. This is an important presentation, and I would like now uh, to invite Dr. Norit Gaffney for our last presentation. Dr. Norit Gaffney is a psychotherapist, expressive arts therapist, and a supervisor. She serves in the IDF. Um, she's a recognized therapist by the Israeli Ministry of Defense, and she is a Qigong instructor. instructor. 
Um, Dr. Norit Gafni will give the presentation on Qigong practice focus groups as a motivate and activism process for people who experience traumatic loss. Welcome, Norit. Wow, I'm overwhelmed by this all, what I've heard now. And I want to add my less than 15 minutes marathon that combines together body, mind, bereavement, and metaphor making. And we'll do it through Qigong. Qi is energy, gong or kong is movement or skills. So Qigong is the skills of moving energy. And we'll try it just in a minute. Qigong is a part of ancient Chinese medicine that sees health in a, in a holistic way. It means that we know about nerve system in the body and blood system and other system in the body. The Chinese medicine says that there, there is another system in the body and it's called the qi, the energy system, which combine body and mind, all in the body, and we as human beings, with the surrounding. And we, if we speak about a bereavement, we can now try to understand what happened, okay? It also says that everything that has been born will end and change to something else. The Qigong is the part, the active part of this uh, Chinese medicine. The active part, it says that a human being must take care of moving energy in his body. Okay, it's the active way. The second thought that combined me to you. So in order to understand Qigong, let's, let us try, okay? So put one hand, put your leg on the floor both legs on the floor. Put one hand on your chest and one on the belly. It doesn't matter each one, where is everyone? And just start to breathe. And I'll breathe also because I feel myself very, very pressured. So let's breathe together. Gently, normally breathing. You can close your eyes if you want and just feel your body. That's all, not changing, embrace any feelings and thoughts that came from your body. And try to find an image. The body feels as if And say it loud. Is your mic off? It doesn't care. My body feels as if, as if it's stuck and stand inside of it now, mine. Okay. Now, let's start with something else. Open your hands and breathe in. Close your hands and breathe out. Breathe in and breathe out. Breathe in from your nose and breathe, breathe out from your mouth. Good. Now tap on your sternum with your fingers. Hard, you can tap hard. It's good now for COVID and everything. It's helped the lungs. And open it to your shoulders. Good. Thank you. 
And now let's take our fingers, nails, and tap them together like we are going to make, we hold two stones and going to make a fire. Try to hear the stones and light the fire. And again, try it. And take another image. Let's play piano on our front head. Just play music. And then make a big dramatic accord. And again, play something. Good. And an accord. And when you do it again, just sense the feeling that on your face when you're doing it. And the sense when you're doing an echo. Good. Now brush your hands together. Make like 20 brushes. And put your hands wherever your body needs now. Okay. Now please put both hands on your stomach, on your belly. And try to breathe and let the hands show the air where to go. We want you to go to the belly. And try to move the hands with the belly by breathing in. Good. And relax your shoulder. Take all this energy out. And again, put one on, hand on your chest and one on your belly. And just breathe naturally. Try to understand if something can change in your body now. and try to find an image. I feel like, and you know the body speaks very slow, not like the mind. So take your time. And if anyone felt any change in his body, please raise your hand so I can see it. Okay, thank you. It was a very, very short demonstration, but we came to our body. And now I have to relax myself. So, is any one of you his um, image change for his body? Good. Can you tell us what has changed, please? You have to. From con container to the bird. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, what happened? Well, images and metaphors have to move to move in the body, to be in connect. They are creating in the body-mind connection and then come out between me and you and others and history and time like we heard before. So when a traumatic 
event happens, this connection between body and mind sometimes disconnect. In a moment, everything is stopped, even metaphors. Sometimes that's stuck, like our body. Everything is stuck. And you know, when you hear um, people in grief after loss, and they said, I feel like a stone. There is a stone in my body. There is a rock in my body. Okay? So I would like to give an example from my research the, for a, it was using Qigong as an intervention in bereavement, bereavement groups, okay? It was taken in Israel during 1917, 1916, 1917. All of the participants experienced sudden and violent loss for murder. They lost their fathers, sons, daughters, and husband. It occurred between two years to 15 years, and they were all in groups, talking groups, support groups. When they came to this intervention, which was only talking with our bodies and Qigong movements. They all uh, have very heavily body aches, lower back, upper back, neck, shoulders, knees, high blood pleasure, pressure, sorry, how blood. And they didn't want to move. They had very, very difficulty moving themselves. Everything was aching. So we asked them, you know, Qigong you can do physically by standing, by sitting, lying down, and even in imagination. There is a sentence to say that where the mind goes, Qi follow, energy follow. And think about it when you're angry or sad, where your mind goes, chi follows, the energy follows. So we ask them to come and just be with us in the room and just try to feel their body. They didn't want to feel the body. The body carries all the pain and they didn't want to feel it. They just want to talk about it. And I, I'll, let Louis, I'll tell you about a very beautiful story that occurs on the four meeting. We have 12 meetings in each group. On the four, four, fourth meeting, one of the father, when we asked him, how do you feel in the body right now? He says, well, when I come to this group, I feel like I put my suitcase aside and then I can breathe. The other father, the one that wouldn't want to feel his body, says, well, I feel good, so I'm not feeling my body, so I'm okay. When I'm not feeling my body, I'm okay. I don't want to feel it. Then he said to him, well, I don't know if I can put my suitcase away. I think it's a part of me now. And the first father said to him, just put it near you. So if you have to take it, you'll take it again. And if you have to touch it, just, just touch it. And it was very beautiful. He just literally took something, imagining suitcase and put him near him. And from this, that day on, he started to feel something in his body. It wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. And over the days, he just tried to put it farther and farther from here. And one mother said to him, well, don't worry. Nobody is going to take your suitcase. We all have our own. 
So the suitcase is a metaphor. It is a group metaphor. One started and then the other took it and other one and other. We have a group metaphor. The suitcase is a metaphor for all the pain and the grief. And the opportunity to put it just for a moment beside and try how is it to live with the suitcase on my side. And when I came to the last interview with this person, he said to me, you know, from that moment, the, the last uh, interview was far, four months after the groups were ended. We wanted to see what happened four months after the group were ended. So he said to me, you know, now, when I want to remember my son, I put the suitcase away. And then I can remember happy things we did together. And there is an Israeli writer, which called uh, David Grossman. He wrote a gr his grief work as a book. After we just, just have two more minutes. I'm sorry, yeah. I just wanted to write you, but <laughs> okay. He wrote his grief work after his son was died in the army. And he said, I wish I can uh, disconnect sorrow for remembering so that I can remember my son without falling into the sorrow. Well, this was my 15 minutes. Qigong bereavement, and metaphors. So now I'll breathe, and you can breathe with me if you want. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. Thank you very much uh, for this final, uh, uh, f wonderful final of our um, seminar. And um, we actually ran out of time, but um, we have two questions, Sylvia. And um... yes, uh, I think that, uh, there are three questions actually. Two are related to the, the current situation with COVID 19. Um, so the first one was uh, related to the, um, the, the presentation that we've just uh, um, heard from uh, Nurit. And uh, David is asking whether the Nurit, you observed any differences uh, or do you think that COVID-19 and the fact that people uh, could not see uh, their relatives uh, that were dying, uh, could these have affected their, um, the way they, um, they went through uh, the bereavement process and uh, have you noticed anything in your clinical experience? Uh, yes, in Israel we started as the COVID-19 occurs and people had started to dying from it. There is a great, um, wow, Barley, a process that says it called me Mama Kim from the death, from the deep. From death. From death, yeah. yeah. And we are calling everyone that uh, has lost a family, a member family, we are calling them and we ask them from the hospital, how can we help you? You have three meeting, telephone meeting, or Zoom meeting, and we are trying to, to, to know what happened. Now doctors had started to make videos uh, before people were dying, just saying with them prayers and um, let them know you love them. And we have this, um, this moment of a uh, Levaya. Funeral. So after I, I, I forgot all my English, okay. after I just settled down in my chair again to be a student, so forgive me. Uh, <laughs> so we're doing the Levaya in a funeral, yes. in, a funeral in the Zoom that everyone can see it. And they have a shiva rooms. 
but it's very, very difficult because I, I work with one woman and she said the uh, Shiva is for people talking about the death, about the man who died, a husband who died. In now, in the Zoom, everybody wants to hear because nobody was with him. What happened? And I have to talk it and talk it again. And then everything, you know, the Shiva is only, is also about talking, but through the seven days, you nearly hear about the person. So it's very difficult. It's very difficult. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Nuri. Thank you for sharing it. Uh, a second question is always also related to COVID-19 situation and someone is asking uh, whether the concepts of embodiment and an activism could be applied uh, also today uh, and in a sort of like online uh, setting. Uh, this, this question is open to everybody actually to like any presenter who wants to share their experience maybe or their clinical experience or just considerations like reflections about this. Yes, do you think that they can be applied also in an online setting? Gianarco, <laughs> do you want to add your insights? Um, I can share with you that we had a, a very a large study with art therapists all over the world. There were 1,300 participant art therapists and they share uh, some very unique and innovative experiences uh, regarding the ability to conduct embodied experience through the Zoom, through the online and video conferences. Um, we have some troubles, for example, interpersonal synchrony is almost uh, impossible, but uh, we realize that you can even, uh, um, we can even conduct some uh, mirror games playing, uh, some movement dance therapy playing. We were able to conduct dramatic and psychodramatic is the vignette and also to conduct art uh, therapy with actually um, uh, materials that were delivered to the um, participant or even in the digital um, uh, in the digital uh, applications where participants were able to create collages, uh, create paintings. Uh, and um, uh, we believe that when we will be able to explore, to explore it more deeply, uh, we will also realize that we have uh, also uh, some meaningful em embodied experience that uh, enable to make sense uh, of the inner experience and to uh, also and um, uh, um, uh, some um, uh, unique and important transformation um, in the therapeutic process. And Jen Marco, I know that you had a very, uh, do you want to add something or? Oh, yeah. Um, we did two researches about it um, and uh, it was very interesting to see how the online, the telepsychodrama session um, uh, can also um, share psychological content uh, uh, among the participants. Uh, they miss sometimes the, the physical contact, uh, most of all, but um, the emotions uh, can be shared uh, in a very right way. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I think there is only one last question. So there is uh, Leah, she's a teacher and uh, um, she would be interested in knowing whether psychodrama um, could be applied also, well, it could be applied also with like adolescents, for example. Um, and uh, she would be interested in knowing whether there are any differences uh, and uh, whether this, she could sort of like bring psychodrama also to the school she works in. And yes. This, this is your question. I don't know whether you, uh, anyone of you. I, uh, I can ask, uh, I can answer also. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course, <laughs> we are doing psychodrama and drama therapy techniques. Actually, usually when we, um, when we come to children and adolescents, we combine um, uh, between drama therapy methods and psychodrama methods. We are doing vignette, we use the empty chair, we use role reversal. 
we use also technique of drama therapy and um, the playful and uh, entering into the dramatic reality with the children and exploring and actually create an imaginary world with them. Uh, this is also a psychodramatic technique uh, that was developed by um, Ohad Nahar, um, no, not Ohad, Ohad is Han, but uh, Naharin. And um, so they are very special techniques for, for children and adolescents. And also playback theater is very useful with adolescents. And yes, of course. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so we can summarize now. Um, we would like to thank you all for attending. And thank you very much for the presenter. I think it was, we had a very rich, a perspective on the um, embodied and activism perspective and the ability of the arts um, uh, uh, to, to be able as a, to conduct as an activist perspective and activist interventions. And um, Maybrit, would you like to add something or Sylvia, um, the other presenters? Um, no, I think I just want to like to thank you all. It was really interesting, and uh, also the clinical experience uh, experiences that you brought, I think, were really insightful and really interesting. So thank you. Thank you. All. Thank you very much. And um, Shabbat Shalom here in Israel, and a good, wonderful weekend for you all. Awesome weekend. Thank Have you all. Have a nice weekend. Thank you very much for organizing. It was wonderful. Thank you very much, Mabia. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you. Thank you, Sashi. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. Finito.